Heavenly Father, what another glorious day you have provided for us. It's a, it's a miracle. It's marvelous the way you have designed this world. We are in awe of it and of you. And we worship you. We adore you. We glorify you. As we come together in this study, Lord, we would be thankful for the mind that you created in Paul and, and the truths that you inspired him to write down. And now we ask that you would use our minds, touch our minds, fill our minds with that same truth, that you would help us understand in full what you inspired in Paul. In Christ's name, amen. So, as I said, it's been after a number of years and a great deal of research that I'm basing this presentation of Romans on, reflecting a rather modern day perspective in scholarship. So the things that we're going to be talking about here, quite honestly, are not accepted across a wide spectrum of academia yet. I think they, I think they will get there because I think what we're, what we're looking at here changes, changes the way the church has traditionally looked at Paul and Romans. This is Romans, an amazing letter written by an amazing man who has had an amazing impact on the church and on the world. We're going to talk about 19 facts that you don't know about the Apostle Paul over a period of time. Much of what you read doesn't look at Romans as a letter. Much of what you read looks at Paul this way. Talks about the book of Romans. Or let's, you know, let's understand the, um, the um, summer of, of uh, writings of, of Paul in Romans. This is not a book. So, in my opinion, that's one of the first misinterpretations, misunderstandings that people approach this Bible uh, study with when they talk about Romans. It's not a book. It's a letter. People write books for a whole different reason than they write letters. Right? So, to read this like a book put you in a frame of mind, a frame of reference or perspective that is going to miss some of what Paul is saying because Paul's writing a letter, not a book. Unfortunately, much of the impact then that has come from this letter into the church is based upon some sometimes significant misunderstanding of what Paul's really saying. Because we're, we have the wrong perspective. Why? What have the church scholars missed that have caused them to make some of these inaccurate interpretations? And this is particularly troubling again because Paul's words, especially here in Romans, has been used to establish the majority of the church's doctrines. Think about it. And so now what we have to do is we have to go back and look at some of those interpretations rather dubiously because of the short-sightedness in the former interpretations that they've made. A few recent scholars have paid more attention to the key features that make a difference in understanding what Paul is really saying. In fact, one of them, a commentator 
makes the statement that the traditional and much current exegesis, that means study of the scriptures, condemns the interpretation of Paul to confusion and contradiction. And in fact, that's one of the issues that we have with some people talking about Paul's letters. They think it's one thing here and another thing there, and, and therefore they're contradictory and we're confused. No, shouldn't be that way. What's the game changer? Well, in simplest terms, the game changer is being able to know and understand Paul as a Jew, a bona fide, proud Jew. Traditional scholarship studied Paul from a Gentile Christian perspective and often, therefore, interpreted his words from that wrong perspective. And because of that, they have made some wrong conclusions. How did that happen? Well, it's pretty simple to understand. Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles. And so they assumed that this Gentile perspective was what Paul was writing from. Truth is, Paul was first and foremost a Jew. He was a full Jew before he met Christ, and he remained a full Jew after he met Christ. You hear that? Because that's profound. He died a proud Jew who believed in Jesus Christ. So, when the existing Hebrew culture and influence of the Jewish teachings that were the core aspect of who Paul is are removed from the interpretation of Paul's words, then you are likely to get a misinterpretation of what Paul is saying. That's our basis here. If we do not fully embrace and study the Jewish society of the Second Temple era that Paul was entrenched in, we will miss the key component to what he is meaning to say. So let me back up a second. Are we clear about what I say in the Second Temple era? Remember the first temple was built by Solomon. Doesn't say that in world history, but quite frankly, that temple could have been one of the seven wonders of the world. It was spectacular. In 586 AD, the Babylonians came, completely destroyed that temple. Then it got rebuilt. Remember with Nehemiah and Ezra? Temple got rebuilt. Some of the people were crying. Why? Because the second temple wasn't nearly as spectacular as the first temple. Second temple is what is standing during the life of Jesus and Paul. However, Paul would have come close to being able to see the destruction of the second temple in 70 AD when the Romans once again came in, destroyed it, and to this day, it has not been rebuilt. In fact, what's on that site this day, you know? The Dome of the Rock. The Muslim shrine is on the exact site of this temple this day. And that's one of the things that people are looking at and for in terms of the future. Because that is 
the holy site. All right. All Jewish society and each Jewish person from birth to death was based upon the halakha of the Jewish faith. Halakha simply means the Jewish law, the laws of Moses and the laws of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And that includes Paul's life. Jewish halakha was important to Paul. Some modern scholars have almost used Paul as a systematic theology textbook, especially Romans, because it has a great deal of theology in it. Many times they have come close to having Paul in this interpretation even depart from some of Christ's words and teachings because of the Jew Gentile viewpoint. And I mean that seriously. Many scholars have Paul creating a Gentile faith separate from the Jewish faith because he gave up his Jewishness in order to be a Christian, a follower of Jesus. And so they interpret what he says according to that. And I believe, and I'm teaching you, it's wrong. That's wrong. That's a wrong understanding. That's a wrong <laughs> interpretation. You're going to come to wrong conclusions that way. The writings in Paul's letters must be understood to uphold all of Christ's words, yes, but also all of the Old Testament words of Moses and the prophets in order for you to understand the truth of Paul's writings. So let's zero in on Paul's experience right now using Paul's own description about himself, who he says he is, which, interestingly enough, as we read these words, this is Paul's description of himself after he met Jesus Christ. After he's a believer. So clearly what this shows us is Paul never gave up his Jewishness. So let's go first to Acts 22, verses 3 and 4, where he says, I am a Jew. I mean, he proudly proclaims that in front of the magistrate where he's on trial. Born in Tarsus in Sicily. Now we know he was born both then as a full-blooded Jew and as a Roman citizen. So I've given you this little map right here so you might be able to appreciate some geography. It always helps us, you know, to have a picture in our minds. So you can see where Tarsus is, and you can see where Jerusalem is. Jerusalem is where he ended up studying um, to be a Pharisee, but he was born up in Tarsus. In Acts 22, 27, he says, So the tribune came and said to him, Tell me, are you a Roman citizen? Because this is when he is, his life is in danger from his accusations. And he said, yes. And the tribune answered, well, I bought this citizenship for a large sum. Paul says, but I am a citizen by birth. He's a Jew, and he's a Roman citizen. <clears throat> I'm a Jew born in Tarsus of Sicily, but was brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, educated strictly according to our ancestral law, being zealous for God just as all of you are today. Now, the thing that's fascinating about this statement as we uncover it is, all right, he is an apostle. He's claiming in the first verse of Romans to be an apostle defending himself as a Pharisee. 
who has been brought up according to the strict ancestral laws. You see what's happening here? I mean, Paul, Paul clearly is still a Jew. Now, just as there are competing prestigious schools, the Ivy League schools, and seminaries today, so there were competing schools in Jewish tradition, in Jewish education. Gamaliel would have been considered by many to be the leading scholar of Jewish halakha. Certainly he was one of the best if he wasn't the best. So Paul is bragging on this. And again, what was Paul studying to be? He was studying to be a Pharisee. So Acts 23, 6, when Paul called out in the council, brothers, I am a Pharisee, the son of Pharisees. So don't lose track of who Pharisees are. Pharisees were the ruling teachers and the keepers of the law, the halakha, among the Jews. They were some of the highest class citizens, the most religious, truthfully, the most religious of all Jews. There's no reason to denigrate them. They, they were the epitome of what it means to be a Jew, living by strict rules. Saul, who is Paul, became the Pharisee of all Pharisees according to his own words. He surpassed the, his peers in Jewishness. Galatians, I advanced in Judaism beyond many among my people of my same age, for I was more zealous for the traditions of our ancestors. In fact, he claims that he kept the law blamelessly. That's about as bold a statement as you can make. Look what he says. If anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew, born of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, <coughs> as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Wow. So as a Pharisee, Paul detested the heresy of the Christian sect. They were blasphemous. They were intolerable. And he made it his business to eliminate them. That's who Paul is. Acts 22.4, I persecuted this way up to the point of death by binding both men and women and putting them in prison. He had connections, he had connections and permission, thank you, <coughs> from the high priest in order to persecute the church with unlimited power. So here's the bottom line. Paul had some seriously impressive worldly Jewish credentials. What does that mean? That means Paul was probably the least likely person of his day to become a believer in Jesus Christ. Now, take that in. That's an incredible perspective. At his conversion, Saul was given a new name and a new purpose. But he was the same man. I'm going to read to you his conversion story right? out of the book of Acts. But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus so that he, if he found any belonging to the way, 
men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he was on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? That's just an amazing experience, right? I mean, think, think who Paul is, what Paul's doing, and out of nowhere, this is what happens. <clears throat> and Paul said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. So they led him by hand and brought him into Damascus, and for three days he was without sight and he neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and Ananias said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight. And at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. That's a pretty amazing statement, isn't it? Huh? I mean, Paul doesn't even know this yet. And God is telling Ananias, No, I've chosen him to go to the Gentiles and kings and the people of Israel. For I will show him, I will show him, how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed, entered the house, laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you came, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately, something like scales fell off his eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized. And taking food, he was strengthened. Then Saul proclaims Jesus in the synagogues for some days that he was with the disciples in Damascus. And immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogues. Do you hear that? Here's Paul one day and then next day proclaiming Jesus in the synagogues saying he is the Son of God. And all who heard him were amazed. And they said, is not this the man who made havoc in Jerusalem? Those who called upon his name and as he has he not come here for this purpose, to bring them bound before the chief priests? But Paul, Saul, increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews. And that's, that's a key feature for us. He confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. That's an incredible statement again. When many days had passed, the <coughs> Jews plotted to kill him. 
Why? Do you get this? Do you get what's happening here? Can you can you gain this picture? We're talking about Paul, who's writing this letter to the Romans. An amazing life. Well, there is a lot of serious theology in Romans. The point is that Paul was not purposefully writing a book of theology. Let me say that again. While there's a lot of theology in Romans, Paul was not purposely writing a book of theology. So that's a misinterpretation. It's similar today to how people actually misuse the Bible itself. Is there a biology in the Bible? Yeah. Is it a biology book? No. No, it's not. Is there astronomy there? Yes. Is it an astronomy book? No, there's not. Is there geology there? Yes. Is there zoology there? Yes. Is there chemistry there? Yes. Is there math there? Yes. But the Bible is not a book of any one of those. The Bible is a book of God's historic and prophetic plan to bring those who have been made in his image into an eternal relationship with him. That's called the plan of salvation. Now, does that plan of salvation include some of this other information? Yeah, it does. But that's not its purpose. So let's go back to this letter to Romans. Is there theology in this letter of Romans? Yeah. Is that the purpose? No. What's Paul talking about? Paul's talking about God's plan of salvation for all people, Jews and Gentiles. That's what the letter's about. It's not a book of theology. In that letter, Paul was working out and addressing the most difficult aspect of life for both Jews and Christians. Who better to do that? Right? Paul completely understood the Jewish halakha. And now he completely believed in Jesus Christ as the Son of God. He is in a unique position. He's a Jew that was convinced that Jesus was the Messiah Christ, which changed his perspective on the Old Testament. He still knew the Old Testament, but now he saw it differently than what he was taught from Gamaliel. It changed his life. And now he became a slave, not to the Old Testament God, but he became a slave to Jesus Christ. He says that in the first verse. We'll get to that. Next came the most dramatic issue facing Christianity and the Jews. And that is, as this church is unfolding in the first century, what do we do with the Gentile converts? Because they're not Jews. How can these Gentiles be equally incorporated into the church? How? It shouldn't be allowed, according to the Jews. But it needs to be allowed, according to Jesus Christ. You see the problem? This is what Paul has this unique perspective of. That's what he's writing this letter about. Paul's trying to make sense of that in his own life, from his own life, and into the church, using his knowledge of the Holy Scriptures with his Jewish training as well as his relationship with Jesus Christ. That is so powerful. Don't miss that. that. That's the whole game changer right here. That experience is unique to Paul. That's a good reason to say that is likely 
why God chose Paul. Let's read how Paul begins his letter now. These words are some of the most radical words in the whole letter. And there are some radical words in this letter. But these, even these first two sentences are amazing. And they set the tone for all the rest of our interpretation of this letter. And we're going to study them in, in, in detail later. But let's read them right here. Paul, a servant, some translations might say slave, of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle set apart for the gospel of God. Now, we're going to spend quite a bit of time on just that one phrase right there because there are four amazing issues in that phrase. Set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh and was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations. Now, <clears throat> Paul's writings have many, if you look at that, that's all one sentence. <laughs> Paul's writings have many situations like that. Here's why. I mean, if we were literally, if Paul was literally handwriting that, that wouldn't have happened. What is Paul doing here? We'll talk about it later, but Paul is speaking this. And another person is transcribing it. We speak much differently than we write, don't we? That's why there's a lot of these what we call run-on sentences in Paul. Because he's, his mind is just going, and he's rattling off these words, and that guy's furiously trying to write them down. All right, so. Romans is a letter from Paul to the church in Rome. Now, this is the only church that Paul writes to that he did not start. That's pretty significant, right? All the other letters that we have from Paul are his churches. In fact, Paul has never been to Rome. And he's writing them a letter. Keep, that's another perspective. I mean, I'm trying to give you this overview so we can see what's going on here. We don't know who started the church in Rome. We don't have that in history. What we do know in the church of Rome is that there was quite a combination of both Jews and Gentiles trying to mix in that church. Ipso facto, that means that church was dealing with this issue that Paul was writing this letter about. That's why Paul is writing this letter, trying to help them as he knows and understands it <clears throat> because of his training and because of his knowledge. Now, also, We need to appreciate this about Paul's letters. This is another new perspective. This is another game changer. Paul was proficient in multiple languages. But because the common language of the day was Greek, He's communicating in speech and letters to the Gentiles in Greek 
so people can understand his words. But while he's doing that, he's writing about Hebrew and Jewish traditions and teachings and thoughts and words. So let me read that again. He's communicating in the Greek language, but he's writing about Jewish and Hebrew things. Do you see that perspective? Do you see, you see what's happening here? That means he takes a Hebrew thought and word and has to find a Greek word that would come close to sharing what he's trying to say. He can't do that perfectly. Period. Nobody can. It can't be done. And quite honestly, that's the problem facing us with the Bible. So let's just take it aside here for a moment. There is no perfect, best, top of the line translation of the Bible. For that very reason, you're trying to take thoughts in one language and you're trying to come as close as you can in another language. Each translation has some strengths and some weaknesses as they do that. There is no absolute word-for-word -word translation that is better than all the others. None are the best because none can do it perfectly. So we must be careful to research the Hebrew concepts behind the Greek words in order to really grasp what Paul is talking about. And remember, Paul is one of the highest educated Jews at that time. So that's what we're trying to accomplish here in this study. That's the new perspective that we're reading the book, the letter of Romans in. Here's what makes Paul the premier scholar, and he is the premier scholar of the New Testament. First, Paul graduated summa cum laude, top of the class from Gamaliel's school of Torah, learning the laws of Moses and the Mitzvah and the specific Jewish Halakha. He was the best of the best. Then he graduates from Jesus' school of Halakha, learning about the grace and truth of salvation from the Holy Spirit. So he is a top scholar on both sides, putting this together. Now how can we say that for sure? Because Paul tells us that. For I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. For I did not receive it from any man. Don't lose track of that. Paul wasn't taught anything by another person. He says it right here. Nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit. Hello? Paul knew just as much as any of the other apostles. And he didn't talk to any of them about that. None of them taught him. I'm going to make a statement that says, I believe, in fact, he knew more than the other apostles because he had the top training from Gamaliel and the rest of them were fishermen and tax collectors. You see how how unique Paul's position is here. 
Paul is able to share something that's brand new. And he can do it both to the Jews and to the Gentiles because of his life experience. Listen, you maybe are already sick of hearing that, but I'm going to repeat it again and again because this is the best way for us to really appreciate Paul's letter to the Romans. Galatians 1 verse 17, Paul says, Nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were already apostles before me, but I went away at once into Arabia, and afterwards I returned to Damascus. Then, after three years, I did go up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas, Peter, and stayed with him 15 days. So what happened? For three years, Jesus and the Holy Spirit were educating Paul in the halakha of salvation. That's how he learned it. So when, when you read things like in Corinthians chapter 11, in, uh, in 1 Corinthians, you might remember, Paul addresses many of the problems or issues that are in that early church there. One of them has to do with communion. This is what he says. This is mind-boggling based upon what we just read here. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way also the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant of my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Was Paul there? No. Had he talked to the other apostles? No. Did he know exactly what went on? Yeah, he did. It's astounding. Let me continue with that reading from Galatians. <clears throat> but I did not see any of the other apostles except James, the, the Lord's brother. In what I am writing to you before God, I do not lie. Then I went to the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and I was still unknown by sight to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only heard it said, the one who formerly was persecuting us is now proclaiming the faith he once tried to destroy. And they glorified God because of me. So, the prevailing academic view has been to see Paul as a Gentile Christian, establishing the Gentile church and creating a Gentile theology. And I'm telling you that's wrong. That's a bad perspective. That's short-sighted. We need to change that in order to see Paul more clearly. Paul was fully Jewish his entire life. Here's an example. We already saw it once. What, what did he do in, in Damascus? The first thing he did was to go to the synagogue and proclaim Jesus Christ. In fact, in all of Paul's missionary journeys, what do we routinely read? Paul was in the what? Synagogues interfacing with the Jews on his missionary journeys. Why? Because the Jews he could relate to because of his training 
in the Torah and the Halakha, and he could speak to them about the reality of Jesus Christ as the Son of God from their training and understanding, and they in turn then could share and help the Gentiles believe the story about Jesus Christ. He was a Jew. He stayed a Jew. He was a proud Jew. And what Paul helps happen here is he's able to clarify for the Jews in Judaism what was truly Holy Scripture because he calls upon the Old Testament prophets and the law frequently. He is clarifying for them what part is true Scripture and what part is traditional halakha that has come from the Pharisees and the rabbis so that they can see clearly that God had always intended to send the Messiah Jesus who would be also for the Gentiles. A lot of seminaries, including the one I went to, teach that Paul was laying out a new Gentile-oriented system of theology. All that is, is seminary holocaust. That's just seminary law. It's not God's truth. Paul was writing a letter to a church with Jews and Gentiles trying to explain and help them mix together according to God's plan in the Old Testament and according to God's plan with Jesus Christ the Messiah. <laughs> what are we looking at here with time? Let me go a little bit further. Letters, interestingly enough, and this separates Christian scripture from all other religious writings. Letters are the primary form of the New Testament. Think of that. Christianity is based upon Paul, mostly Paul, but other letters, people writing about faith and Jesus to other people. 21 of the 27 New Testament documents are letters. That's a pretty high percentage, isn't it? Depending upon how you want to determine it, either 13 or 14 of those 21 letters belong to Paul. And there are, depending upon how you want to interpret it, seven or eight other writers of letters. James, Peter, John, Jude. And the one that gets disputed the most is who wrote Hebrews? Did Paul write Hebrews? Or did someone else write Hebrews? Nine or ten depending upon, again, how you interpret it, are from Paul to the churches. Four of them are from Paul to individuals, these letters. Right? Now there's a standard letter form. There's a sender's name, an office, the name of the recipient, the greeting, the main message, the farewell with greetings, and then the signature. That is a standard procedure, just like you know, we know we used to be taught that in school. I don't even want to think about what they get taught today. But we used to get taught in school the etiquette for writing a letter, or writing an essay, or writing a document. This was the standard for the day. Authorship of Paul as the writer to the letter to the Romans is virtually unanimous 
across the academic world. That's unheard of. That's incredible. It's probably the only thing the academic world virtually agrees totally on. Um, all the other letters, a lot of debate. No, Paul couldn't have written this. Look how he uses that word. He doesn't use that word like that, any other. Anyway, it goes on and on, all kinds of disputes. Paul's letters are named for the recipients, which is kind of interesting, because all the other letters are named for the author. Okay, don't know why, that's just how it works. Paul's letters in the New Testament are in order according to their length. You might not have realized that before. So Romans is the largest letter by far, 50%. Right? The only other letter, uh, Romans, the letter to the Romans is the only letter written to a church where Paul was not known by that church. They knew of him, but they did not know him. Rome at the time was the greatest city in the world. It had the most problems in the world as a result of that. It's unclear whether the Jews or the Gentiles were the majority in the church at Rome. But we do know that the makeup was mixed and therefore they were struggling with this issue that Paul is addressing. <laughs> Heavenly Father, send us out from here, Lord, with, uh, with seeds, again, that have been planted today, that we might have a new understanding, a new vision. It might grow from these seeds as to how we look at and what we think about Paul and Paul's letters to the Romans, and may that have a dramatic impact on what we understand to be the truth and how we live our lives. In Christ's name I pray, amen.